So glad to see so many of you here, or at least uh, a bunch of us who might be interested, who are interested in uh, the question of access to remedy, but also meaningful stakeholder engagement for remedy. Uh, so we're convening this meeting, this workshop, uh, as part of the GBSN for Human Rights uh, Cluster for Gender on Gender, uh, together with Lara, and uh, the cluster on the agri-food sector uh, that is led by, uh, by Barrett. So we organized a meeting with a view to develop both the research and teaching agenda. I guess for business school, Remedy is maybe not yet up there in terms of uh, what we are researching, but also what we are teaching to, to our students, or at least uh, I know that for my colleagues, uh, they would struggle to understand if I tell them about Remedy for Human Rights. Uh, let alone responsibility for human rights is still a, a big question for some of them. Um, but we thought this is uh, this is an emerging field. Uh, we've heard a lot about state-based judicial mechanism. We still remain the core. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, state-based judicial mechanism was saying remain the core of what we should aim for, at least to get justice for, for victim. But maybe in terms of prevention, uh, operational-based mechanism, um, as well as perhaps minimum redress, can be... Uh, a way forward to provide uh, workers, but also community with a part of code through, through to, to business. But in our research, whether we look at gender, whether, whether we look at migrant workers in the agri-food sector, uh, we have stakeholders with, who are highly marginalized. And marginalization in society, but also in organization or wherever you are far down the supply chains means also difficulty to access remedy. Um, so the two presentation we have here, uh, and we have the, the chance to have people who've uh, actually worked with people who are marginalized in the agri-food sector and done empirical research uh, on, uh, on migrant workers with a gender aspect, uh, will be telling us a bit more about what they found in the UK, but also in the US. And the UK, for WANA, it's a new field. Uh, so WANA and NARA are researching grievance mechanism uh, on um, in the UK for migrant workers. And Alicia looked at workers-driven uh, mechanism uh, previously. But before we go into uh, the specific presentation, Barrett is going to tell us a bit more about the problematic in the agri-food sector, uh, which is her field. So over to you, Barrett. Yes, thank you. And also a very warm welcome uh, from my side, uh, also on behalf of the, of the agriculture cluster. We are very happy to have this conversation today because it's, uh, as Samantha already indicated, a topic that's very uh, important for um, guaranteeing human rights for all workers, but it's uh, at times also overlooked. So in terms of the agriculture field, um, Migrant workers play a significant role in uh, making harvests work, for example, or in uh, in the agriculture sector overall. So the ILO estimates that around 7% of all migrant workers uh, work in agriculture, which um, might not sound too much. Um, most workers, uh, migrant workers work in service uh, industries or in industrial areas. Um, but it also shows uh, part of the difficulty in putting numbers uh, or finding statistics um, for these situations. So um, this number only includes um, migrant workers between countries and doesn't include uh, inner country migration, which is, for example, very common in India, which is also a huge country with a very big agriculture sector. And also it only includes um, regular migration. So uh, none of the informal migrants that also play an important role. And who are even more vulnerable. The numbers of uh, migrant workers in agriculture vary a lot. Um, in the EU, for example, there are an estimated uh, 1 million migrant workers who work in the agriculture sector alone. And uh, in some countries, for example, Italy, that would be up to 27% of the workforce. So it's a significant um, rights holder group, so to say. Um, there's a lot of research about the specific vulnerabilities. Um, a lot of this work is seasonal work. Um, the migrant workers' um, visa is linked to their employment situation. Um, many of the workers are also low or unskilled workers. And, um, and also their, the migration is uh, just seasonal in many cases. Um, for the agriculture sector in specific, um, 
migrant workers work uh, sometimes in remote areas, but also outdoors in the field. So some vulnerabilities can relate to accommodation, for example, or the tasks that they are doing outdoors. And in this respect, the gender aspect also plays a role because uh, women can be more vulnerable to certain circumstances. For example, in terms of accommodation or sanitary um, facilities that can be a significant risk for women or migrant workers who travel with their families um, are an aspect to keep in mind here. So we know about these vulnerabilities, but I'm very happy to discuss today and hear more in the upcoming presentations about how human rights can be enforced and also remedied in case there have been uh, violations. Well, thanks, Berit, for um, the context, which obviously flags out all the marginalization issues that exist in the sector, but also for the particular uh, rights holders we, we're talking about. So I would like to invite uh, Wana Woju, um, who comes from the University of Nottingham, the Rights Lab, where she's a senior researcher. And Wana will discuss the projects they are working on with Lara, uh, who is with us as well, on new judicial grievance mechanism for seasonal agricultural workers in the UK. So Wana, over to you. Thank you, Samantha. I'll uh, share my screen and I'll hope that this works. Uh, can everybody see this? Is the presentation on? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Great. Super. Right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As uh, Samantha already mentioned, uh, my name is Juana Burku and I'm based in the Rights Lab. Rights Lab is a center of research focused on reducing modern slavery and labor exploitation and it's based at the University of uh, Nottingham. I'm also affiliated with the International Center of Corporate Social Responsibility, which sits in the business school again at University of uh, Nottingham. So um, this project is uh, one that I started uh, working on with Laura, who will be hosting the uh, Q&A uh, later on at the end of the session. Our project looks at non-judicial grievance mechanisms for seasonal workers um, in the agricultural sector in the UK setting in particular. So I'll just start by giving a very brief aim of our project, the methods uh, that we use, placing the, the project within the UK context that you'll see it's quite specific, and then I'll delve more into emerging findings and the challenges that lie ahead. So the aim of the projects are really twofold. One is to map the current non-state grievance mechanisms in the British agricultural sector. And second is to, uh, at the end of the project, to be able to propose a tailored and effective grievance mechanism for season seasonal workers, which is aligned with the U UNGPs. The project has only started in August and it will end by July 2024, when we'll also uh, have an output that will be publicly available. The methods that we used um, are, of course, reviewing the uh, drawing on the literature and reviewing um, the academic and great literature as well, and conducting interviews and focus groups with a range of stakeholders. We aim to interview uh, growers, suppliers, supermarkets, workers, and NGOs. For the time being, the emerging findings that I'm going to talk today about are pretty much based on interviews with supplier, supermarkets, and NGOs. We haven't started yet interviewing workers. The interview guide that we designed draws pretty much on the literature that we consulted and on the um, grievance mechanisms, effectiveness criteria as defined by the in the UNGPs. So let me move on a bit to the UK uh, context. Um, prior to Brexit, uh, the agricultural workforce was pretty much composed of Romanian and Bulgarian workers coming to the UK to work in the agricultural sector. Post-Brexit, things change slightly. And the demographics of the, the demographic of the workforce changed uh, completely, actually. So today, most of the workers come from Ukraine and some of the Central Asian countries. The specific thing about the UK sector is that workers pay for their own transport to the UK and pay for their accommodation while in the UK. So it's an employee pay principle driven scheme. Workers are recruited in their home countries by six labor providers that are approved by the UK government. 
who then place them with respective farms in the UK. The body that is meant to oversee this scheme is the Home Office. However, the extent to which the Home Office is um, really overseeing or monitoring the scheme is a big uh, question mark. Workers only have six months, um, uh, are only given visas for six months, and as Berit was mentioning earlier, they are tied to their employer. Uh, they cannot change employers, uh, they are tied to their labor providers, and they can actually ask the labor providers to change the farm that they are working on, but that's only subject to the labor providers approving that. And we have very little insight into that data because uh, nobody wants to make it available, as you would imagine. So we are talking at the moment about 45,000 seasonal workers who are in this situation, and the numbers keep on growing from one year to another. Let me move on briefly to a couple of systemic issues which are linked to the issues I already um, mentioned. So based on the literature and some of the interviews that we conducted, it became very clear to us that um, the Home Office places significant focus on the legal status that the workers have. Pretty much they are concerned with uh, immigration for political reasons or otherwise, but they're not really interested in workers' rights or welfare. There is a clear withdrawal of the state in the UK context from this um, area, which is really increasingly becoming self-regularized by private entities. There is also a lot of lack of data and uh, lack of data transparency about workers. We don't really know, for instance, uh, how many workers are dismissed. We don't know how many seasonal workers, how uh, if their contracts end earlier than promised, earlier than six months. Um, we don't know how many transfers are approved when workers require one. There are a lot of missing pieces of the puzzle, uh, including the fact that uh, labor inspections on farms, for instance, are never made public. Um, in a recent case, for those of you who maybe follow the British news, um, the Home Office was forced actually to publish some reports from farm inspections, uh, but that was only because uh, there are a couple of journalists very active in this field and through a Freedom of Information Act, they managed to uh, make that public. However, the Home Office redacted the names of all the farms and actually stated that if workers would know the name of the farms, they wouldn't wanna go and work there. So it's better just to redact their names and not make that uh, public, which probably gives you a sense of uh, the approach that the body that is meant to be overseeing the scheme takes towards it. So the visa by design is highly problematic for some of the reasons that I already touched on. What grievances do workers have? Uh, pretty much the ones that uh, Barrett already highlighted. Um, most of them are related to living conditions, to the treatment that they have from their managers, but also from other work colleagues. Um, of course, uh, working conditions can be an issue as well as pay dispute and dismissal. However, we see that in the next three bullet points, there is also um, an issue around expectations. It seems that um, the expectations that workers have about accommodation and contractual agreement don't seem to be met on the ground. And this is likely to be linked with recruitment processes. Perhaps um, is an ethical and fair or even illegal recruitment process, especially because six of them uh, state that they have actually paid recruitment fees. And this is actually one of the biggest vulnerability that we see in the, con in the context of the UK, because uh, if you imagine a Nepalese or Indonesian or um, a Kazakh worker coming to the UK, they would have to incur the cost of their flights and of accommodation in the UK, for which they are likely to take a loan or incur a debt. So workers are more likely to be subject to exploitation and to accept that exploitation to some extent um, because they have to pay back their uh, loan and debt that they incurred. Other grievances that we identified is are related to performance targets. Uh, workers are often threatened that if they don't perform to a certain level, uh, they will be dismissed. 
Of course, there's no guaranteed period of work. They may be told they will have a contract for five years, but if the weather is bad, pretty much, and the farmers cannot ensure them five months of work, then they will be asked to return to their home countries earlier, and they will be the ones who will be incurring the costs of organizing flights uh, for the next week, let's say, and paying for that change rather than uh, next month when they, their contract would have ended. And then there is all the issue of contracts not always being translated or given to workers. I should add that uh, this DEFRA survey, DEFRA is the Department for Environment and uh, Food and Rural Affairs in the UK, and it's the only survey that is available that captures some of workers' grievances. There are a lot of issues around this, but there's no data, no other data available. And I'm happy to talk more about this perhaps um, later on. Let me move on to something that uh, perhaps is more of interest for um, those of you um, teaching business management perhaps. So, so far we interviewed mainly suppliers and supermarkets and some of the emerging findings were that uh, there was a very broad understanding of what grievance, uh, grievances uh, and grievance mechanisms mean. So for some supermarkets, for instance, grievance mechanisms were already very prominently mapped in their strategy or human rights policy. For others, they were really just about starting to map them. Some had a very, very clear understanding of what effective grievance mechanisms mean, and they had brochures and um, information sheets published on this that they shared with their suppliers and so forth. Whereas others uh, had no clear understanding at all or what of what an effective mechanism, a grievance mechanism means. In the same manner in which some already piloted some grievance mechanisms, with the help of international organizations, whereas others um, were very far away from piloting anything on grievance mechanisms. And I would add that these were all interviews conducted with top supermarkets from the UK. What united them all, though, in their answers was the fact that supermarkets often perceived themselves as being an escalation point. So their view was that they only interfere when something is flagged to them directly through unseen helpline, and I'll explain a bit later what this is, but basically it's a national helpline that workers can call, or when an issue uh, reaches the media spotlight, and then they are forced to act and interfere. The grievance mechanism approach also uh, depended a bit on who supermarkets and suppliers place their focus on. So some focused a lot more on workers and they thought it was crucial to um, ensure that workers are informed about the system that they're coming into, the rights that they have, um, the risks that they may be exposed to when coming to the UK and how they can, they can mitigate those. And the preferred option is this uh, Just Good Work app, which is funded by the supermarkets in the UK and uh, workers can freely download on their phones. Another approach towards workers, uh, workers focused approach is uh, the fact that of course, supermarkets are very keen for their suppliers to promote such grievance mechanisms. Others um, took a much stronger uh, stance on focusing on their suppliers or growers or suppliers focusing on growers. Uh, for instance, they were very clear that um, they will start requesting at least their tier one suppliers to have grievance mechanisms in place, that they were, they were also clear that they can use the size of their uh, business and the scale of it to leverage their influence over uh, suppliers. Uh, and some of them were very, very active in providing uh, support to their growers, for instance, in the case of suppliers. So they provided empirical research, training, informative materials, uh, and ensured that um, growers were up to date and implementing, they, that they were implementing those. So very, um, in, a, in brief, a very wide range of understanding and approaches to grievance mechanisms. Another thing that got our attention was uh, the fact that they, there are quite a lot of grievances, um, gr grievance mechanisms available. And 
many thought that this was rather confusing for workers. So for instance, a worker would have access to the grower, um, the grower's grievance mechanism, to the supplier's grievance mechanism, to the supermarket's grievance mechanism, and to the labor provider uh, to whom his visa is, his or her visa is tied. At the same time, there is the GLA helpline in the UK, which is the equivalent of a labor inspectorate, let's say in other countries, which also has a national helpline in multiple languages, in all the languages of the seasonal workers. And then there is also the modern slavery helpline, which is run by a charity called Unseen, which seems to be the preferred option for supermarkets because they give Unseen access to their supply um, tiers um, supply chain tiers and uh, supermarket and and seen basically reports back to them when an issue is raised uh, by workers about one of their products or working conditions in one of their um, suppliers. In a nutshell, there are many actors and not a very clear division of roles and responsibilities. For this reason, some have called for a centralized initiative that runs across industries. So one legal framework, uh, one, one single framework for a grievance mechanism, where basically you have a call center available to all workers uh, in the UK or in one uh, industry or more. That call center collects all the data and then feedbacks it back to relevant companies. And then it makes also referrals to relevant NGOs that can offer support to workers. Many justify the need for this um, centralized mechanism uh, in light of the human rights due diligence uh, frameworks and legislation that is being passed in different European countries. The criticism is, of course, that this risks becoming another um, grievance mechanism that just duplicates what's already on the ground and what already works, that it is not an industry tailored approach, so basically doesn't really address workers' needs, but maybe more a business image need. Um, and as one NGO put it, uh, it is a worrying trend towards an increasing privatization of the justice system where businesses have no oversight for, from uh, multi-stakeholders, for instance, or any other body. Other um, issues that got um, our attention was the relation, uh, was the nature of the grievances. Formal grievances are captured, but informal grievances are not always captured. And we know that workers tend to raise grievances primarily in an informal manner. And it is important for those grievances to be captured and logged somewhere in order for trends and patterns to be um, tracked and identified. Some supermarkets do it quite well. Tesco, for instance, has some really good materials in this sense, but many other suppliers don't uh, seem to see a need for uh, logging informal grievances. We're also uh, interested to see whether there is a gendered lens to grievances. Uh, we didn't find one particular strong one, but in um, some cases we have noticed that it wasn't even acknowledged the need for a gendered grievance. So we had a male supervisor, for instance, on a farm, who was really surprised when uh, we asked uh, whether there is a female point of contact or whether there were issues raised by women, um, which perhaps they were uncomfortable to raise with a male supervisor. And he just could not understand why would there be a need for that. So there is a question here of whether some of the mechanisms need to be further uh, tailored or um, some of the stuff needs to be further trained in this sense. And last uh, finding, and I'll head uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, it was really interesting to speak to one supplier in particular who uh, highlighted the fact that they managed to set up workers' committees with seasonal workers. So over 50% uh, of their growers set up workers' committees uh, by incentivizing, uh, incentivizing workers um, with very simple treats, whether that's, you know, a soda and a pizza on a Wednesday night, or also by explaining that this can be something that can be added on their CVs. They provided a very clear uh, structure and job description for the role that workers would play. And this seems to have been uh, quite successful, despite the main challenge of having um, seasonal uh, workforce um, 
working for them. So perhaps this is uh, yeah some thought for thought and something that other companies may be willing to trial in the future. And last, um, what's ahead for us, in particular for the project itself, uh, we will start interviewing workers. However, this is challenging post-Brexit because the seasonal workers now reside on the farm's ground. So we cannot access workers without getting approval from the farms, which is a bit of a concern having to go through this gatekeeper. And of course, there's also the concern that small farms um, may be unwilling uh, or may not have the resources necessary to um, engage with us. But these are our next hurdles. Um, so far, it's been particularly interesting to see uh, that certain themes that you think are quite obvious are actually missing. Uh, hardly anybody that we interviewed made the link between grievance mechanisms and access to uh, remedy. Um, hardly anybody, no, not hardly, nobody mentioned about undocumented workers at all, even if they, in the UK we know that uh, the estimated number of undocumented workers is one, two million people. Uh, most of them are likely to be working in uh, agriculture, construction or services, and yet nobody seems um, to have them mapped anywhere on their radar. And of course, something of interest and that we will uh, follow is the impact that human uh, rights due diligence will have on grievance mechanisms and this uh, increasingly privatized um, role of private companies in managing grievance mechanisms. Thank you all very much for listening. And uh, if you're interested to talk more about this, by all means, please feel free to get in touch with Laura or myself. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Juana. Uh, the UK has not improved, has it? I mean, yeah. Uh, it I'm seems. I mean, it seems that once upon a time. <laughs> Sorry. I'm afraid not much since you left, Samantha. No, it seems to be. Uh, there was something called the Modern Slavery Act at some point, but I guess <laughs> the government forgot about it or something. Guess uh, who manages that? The Home Office as well. <laughs> oh wow. All right. So, <laughs> well, the government needs to do its human rights due diligence to start with and then see for the supermarkets. But saying that's was eliminating the number of um, practices or at least grievances they are trying uh, and the way it is being privatized. But um, before we open question for you, I'd like to also invite Alicia to bring a different perspective, because it seems from what she's uncovered also with Lara, um, there is more of a tradition around workers' grievance mechanism in the US um, and perhaps something that the UK could learn from, or since you mentioned the workers' uh, committees, uh, we have a, another solution and see if it works or, or not. So Alicia, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thank you, Samantha. Uh, I want to first say I don't want to credit the US by having a uh, <laughs> worker driven. No, I think um, this is a special, special little snowflake um, powerhouse that is actually the US government is starting to realize its power and effectiveness. They just won three or received $3 million of funding um, for expansions, but um, they face a lot of opposition in the US. So this certainly is not emblematic of the environment in the US. Um, but I'm excited to be here with you all um, to talk about um, a case study with the Fair Food Program, which focused on the remedial system of the program, um, which I call Rights Holder Driven Remedy. Um, next slide, please. Great, um, so a little background of the case. Um, I did the case study for my thesis um, at Alliance Manchester Business School and for the Office of the High Commissioner's Accountability and Remedy Project. Um, my wonderful supervisor, uh, Dr. Bianchi, had already um, done work with the Accountability and Remedy Project team. And when I expressed interest in researching remedy, very kindly made the connection. Um, I chose to do the case with the Fair Food Program, who um, growing up in Florida, I knew about from their Taco Bell boycott um, when I was younger. Next slide, please. Um, and so for the case study, I did interviews, observations, a focus group, and document analysis to really see how Remedy functions in their worker-driven model. Next slide, please. 
Um, and I think probably everyone on this uh, meeting knows about the Fair Food Program um, and they've been getting more recognition inside and outside of academia. Um, but I'll give a brief introduction. Um, the Fair Food Program is an ethical sourcing program founded and headquartered in Florida. The program is an initiative of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, which is a human rights organization founded by migrant farm workers who've been fighting for farm workers' rights since the early 90s. The program operates within a model they developed called worker-driven social responsibility, which stands in contrast to corporate social responsibility. Um, they developed the model uh, recognizing that uh, corporate social responsibility approaches uh, very often fail to protect the rights of workers at the base of supply chains like these farm workers. So in the worker-driven social responsibility system of the fair food program, participating brands like the ones you see on the slide um, sign a legally binding contract with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers that says they'll only purchase fair food program crops, which are usually tomatoes, but they have expanded to other crops um, and states um, from fair food program growers who have been determined by an independent monitoring body, the Fair Food Standard Council, to comply with the Fair Food Code of Conduct, which was developed by farm workers, so it addresses actual farm worker issues. And the remedial system of the program, those are requirements in the code, which I will go through in a minute. Next slide, please. So, once I gathered my data from the interviews and observations um, focus groups, I analyzed it through a variety of different lenses from accountability, critical theories of justice, racial capitalism, and legal frameworks. But the overarching kind of elephant in the room about barriers to accessing remedy, especially for marginalized workers, um, is power. And that's something that we don't talk enough about. Um, in academia, we do, I feel like, but in, um, we can still talk about it more, and in practitioner world, this huge power imbalance between these workers makes access and remedy just out of the question, right? Um, and the way the program approaches this power imbalance is really interesting because you're not, they realize you're not going to get rid of the power imbalance. There's no way. But if you can find structures and safeguards to somewhat redistribute power to the point that remedy is possible, that protecting rights is possible, that workers can be given a voice in spaces they hadn't had before, you can work within this context of power imbalances. So their mod, the motto of the coalition is conciencia más compromiso es cambio, which is consciousness plus commitment equals change. And so if we start with consciousness, it's not enough to according to the program, um, to reflect on, or to realize that there is power imbalances. You have to critically reflect and investigate this power imbalance. Like what is this, what is the true source of those power imbalances and what is the trajectory and what are the impacts of those, this power imbalance? And that critical reflection is really the origin story of the fair food program. Because there was a group of farm workers in South Florida who would meet to organize to talk about their conditions. They organized actions against their direct employers and boycotts and protests to demand higher wages and better conditions. And while they were effective to up to a point, um, they still weren't being treated like humans. Um, and they realized in these discussions that, okay, so their direct employers certainly have more power than them. Their crew leaders have more power than them. But the ones with the real power are the brands at the top. Um, so they realized that if they can harness that power, that will be able to redistribute some power to workers and they can gain some power over their direct employers. And so that's why in the worker driven social responsibility model of the fair food program, the brands, that's who they're with, or the legally binding agreements, that's who they're with. They're with the brands at the top. And with those agreements, they're able to use market consequences to gain some power over their direct employers. So now they're direct employers, whereas before, like if a woman had reported being like repeatedly sexually assaulted by her crew leader and she said something before, even if they knew, like everyone knows a lot of the, these times, um, they'd say, OK, well, this woman, you know, she's been with us for like six months. We can get another one. But this crew leader, you know, he's been loyal to us. He's been with us for 20 years, whatever. But now under the program, because of this enforcement, if they don't do something about that supervisor, 
then they can't sell their tomatoes to Walmart. They can't sell their tomatoes to McDonald's. So now they're being forced to kind of <laughs> protect workers' rights, to remediate workers' rights. Um, and that's really powerful. So that's the enforcement piece. And then alongside that, they have the education piece, um, which they really put a lot of emphasis on education being a component in the remedial system. Um, the executive director of the Fair Food Standard Council, she told me, I don't know what kind of audit can be accomplished without uh, an effective or an, an educated workforce, because these workers, they're taught to keep their heads down, stay silent. But if you have an educated workforce who both knows their rights and knows that they are protected to enforce those rights, it's a different ballgame altogether. So the program puts a lot of emphasis on um, ensuring that workers know about their rights, but also that they know what to do when those rights are violated. Um, so they have these worker to worker education sessions that they do on every farm where they engage in popular education. So workers know about their rights and what to do um, when those rights are abused and why it's important to report because the remedial system only works if workers use it. Um, and they usually try and do these sessions like a week or two before the audit to really make sure the audit can be effective. Um, next slide, please. Um, and this is a diagram of the remedial system of the fair food program. Um, and even the idea that remedies should be um, thought of as a system was a huge insight from the program because very often in these circles and circles I participate in all the time, we talk about individual mechanisms, how to make a mechanism effective, what does a, an effective mechanism look like? However, the program repeated again and again that remedy needs to be thought of as a system of mechanisms working together. And in the program, they're all under this umbrella of enforcement. Again, the executive director, she told me, um, it doesn't matter how well designed a complaint mechanism is or how well-trained auditors are, or how well-informed your audit approaches. Those things, she said, those things are important, but if, you're not, if they're not operating in a context of power, it's not gonna matter. And in the program, that context is established by the enforcement mechanisms of the legally binding agreements and the market enforcement. And so within under that umbrella, um, they have audits. Um, they speak to over 50% of the workforce um, during the audits. And they, um, out of earshot of supervisors, they do the education sessions right before. And the auditors also uh, manage a 24 hour complaint hotline um, and having the same people do both is um, powerful in way, of ways that I hadn't even thought of. Um, they have a database where they upload hotline data and complaint line data um, to make investigations more efficient. Uh, they also inform they do audit prep sessions before every audit so they can look at the complaints that have been coming in to know like particular actors to look out for or issues that have come up in particular farms to add that additional emphasis so they're not going into audits blind. Also, Anna, I was thinking about um, when you were talking about all the different um, lines and grievance mechanisms, and there are, they have, the Fair Food Standard Council has a hotline, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers has a hotline, and the growers are required to have a hotline, but the, it's a uh, requirement in the code that the, they all have to share their data with the Fair Food Standard Council. So there is different options, because I think it is important for workers to have different options, um, but the, all the data is you know, consolidated. And another thing I was thinking too was because uh, another benefit of having them run by both, the, the auditors were telling me like, we can go when we're speaking to workers during an audit, we can give them our card and say, you know, if there's something else that comes up or something you didn't want to talk about today, like call me, I will answer, or call this number, I will answer, or someone in this field will answer. And they said that's really important because sometimes workers are calling about really sensitive issues and they don't want to call an anonymous call bank, which I think is also an issue with having one centralized where like our workers really going to feel comfortable um, reporting um, certain kinds of issues. Um, education we have um, as a center of the umbrella for um, the reasons I explained that remedial mechanisms really rely on the education approach. Um, they have health and safety committees, which um, I want to like what you were talking about, their requirement of the code that every farm has to have one. And they're made up of management, decision makers, and at least one worker from each crew. And they meet monthly to discuss um, work and health, work and, uh, or health and safety issues at the workplace. 
Um, and again, this is another mechanism to uh, give some power to the workers in spaces where they never had them before. And some of the farms were telling me they do similar um, incentives bonus. They have some have t-shirts and you get um, dinner and things. And th some workers were telling me about, or yeah, that they were on the committees and some workers are really proud they wear shirts. And so people know that they can um, report issues to them and they'll bring it to the committee. Um, and then finally, there's the fair food premium, which is that extra penny per pound paid, which you could say is a form of economic power um, redistribution and establishes a link between the brands at the top and the workers at the base. Next slide, please. Um, and quickly, I just wanted to mention um, two groups of workers that are particularly um, relevant to these discussions um, uh, and the research of both these groups of um, women farm workers and H2A workers. So women farm workers, I won't go into all the reasons why they're um, as vulnerable as other the other farm workers, but um, exceedingly vulnerable be, uh, due to their uh, vulnerability for sexual harassment, sexual ex exploitation, um, and uh, if they have families to feed and having to make these decisions to you report a complaint or feed their families. One woman told me, you know, they'd say, you say something like best case scenario, you get fired, but probably worse. Um, and this is the environment of agriculture, women workers in agriculture. A study found in the US over 80% of women um, farm workers had experienced some form of sexual harassment. Um, and so how do you even begin to provide remedy for these women? Um, and I think the program approaches it the same through education, enforcement, and also understanding that it's a process that, you know, you can't just tell these women who have lived in this culture of retaliation, culture of silence for so long that, oh, now you have these rights, you're protected, you can report these complaints and expect them to just believe right away. And so the beginning seasons of the program where um, there wasn't a lot of use on uh, women reporting sexual harassment, um, but as some cases came in and they did investigations and really notorious crew leaders who everyone knew that they were sexually assaulting women um, were suspended, were fired, were for blacklisted from working at any fair food program farm. Then the women see those results and they start to believe that they had, you call it a use results trust cycle. So it gets used, they see the results and auditor said the proof is in the pudding. That's that's what makes women trust it. When they see the results, um, then they use it more. And when they use it more, you get more results and then you trust it more. So it makes this really kind of empowering cycle. Um, and hearing women talk about the change um, is so moving to hear these women talk about um, feel, finally feeling like they have a voice, that they can say something and that not being scared to go into work, feeling safe when they go into work, I think is um, really powerful. Um, and then secondly is H2A workers, um, very similar to the temporary fees workers that you were talking about, Oana. They come, they're directly um, attached to one employer. The employer has to provide food and shelter um, and a certain number of work hours. So it's basically institutionalized um, paid or paternalism. Um, so in the beginning seasons, the program said, absolutely not. You know, these workers are too vulnerable. It's too high of a risk for exploitation. We're not doing it. No farms can have them. Um, but season after season, uh, growers would say, there's a labor shortage. We need them. We need them. We need them. And so the Fairfield Standard Council started doing some investigation. And it was actually a farm worker's relative, who's also a farm worker in Canada, had come through. They called it a clean, clean channel, clean pathway um, through the Mexican Secretary of Labor's Welfare um, National Employment Service. Um, and so the Fairfield Student Council, they did a fact finding mission. They went to Mexico, they met with the officials and they have all these due diligence processes in place to make sure that workers aren't paying illegal recruitment fees. And they have a partnership organization in the U.S. that works with the employers to ensure like a smooth uh, arrival departure. Um, so now in the fair food program, you can use H2A workers, but only if they come through that clean channel. And so that's one safeguard. And then they also, they have additional education sessions specifically for H2A workers where they learn about additional rights that they have. Like their minimum wage is actually a bit higher and they get the food and the um, food and the shelter and they 
shouldn't pay the recruitment fees. And then during audits, they have like, they make sure they speak to a certain percentage of H2A workers about their conditions to make sure that there aren't any uh, violations occurring specific to H2A workers. Um, last slide, and then I'll wrap up. Um, I thought I'd end by showing some statistics about the violations um, or number of violations since the start of the program. Um, this is a nice way to see that um, use results trust cycle or thing because as the program um, progressed, um, there were more violations and not that wasn't because more violations were happening, but because more workers trusted the remedial mechanisms of the program. Um, and you can see the number of severe violations has decreased significantly since the start of the program. Um, the Fair Food Program likes to say effective remedy is preventative remedy. And so when violations come in, they're not just remediating singular cases, surface level issues, but they really try and um, dig down, they say dig down deep to the problem, work backwards to see the root to see the root of the problem and see if it's happening to other workers. Is it systemic and how can we prevent it from happening in the future? And they do that through a combination of enforcement and education um, for these worker-driven standards. Thank you all, and I look forward to the discussion. Oh, I should also mention the program, it's expanding internationally right now, um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how the remedial system adapts to these different uh, geographic and sectoral contexts. Uh, thanks a lot, Alicia. A uh, lot to learn from uh, from this experience, even if uh, the US perhaps is not the, the best place. Uh, I'd like to invite Lara uh, as uh, our discussant, but also who will take on the, the question, the role of taking questions from uh, our participants. Yes, we don't have much time, so I'll try to be yeah. brief. I'm happy to see Doro more relaxed um, yeah, on a sofa or <laughs> in a more comfortable position. Um, so the the um, purpose of today was actually to start a conversation and to see who was out there uh, interested in the space of uh, access to remedy, um, specifically uh, in business schools. So we want to see if uh, business schools and business management scholars do have a, um, a, a space to claim back uh, in terms of contributing to both research and teaching on um, remedy and access to remedy. Um, Samantha mentioned this, I've been teaching business and human rights for years now, and I mentioned remedy en passant is definitely my main purpose is for students to understand the responsibility of businesses to our to our human rights and I just don't have time to uh, go deep into remedy but maybe it's something that we should change um and the um the option I mean a few um key highlights from from what uh, Oana and Alicia shared but I think um the um uh, if if we think about uh, remedy as the um, the purpose of remedy, the one of rectifying the wrong done to victim, and the um, the entire approach should be uh, victim centered. What we have seen in both projects, uh, even if the fair food program uh, change, of course, uh, over time, and it's a success story, is that the victim uh, becomes very much an object of the remedy rather than the subject and. Uh, the one that determines what uh, remedy should look like. It, it seems almost like the abuser, so the businesses at this moment in time, they're saying to the abused what the remedy should be and should look like, which is problematic. And I have to say, in our interviews with supermarkets, uh, all of them were very aware of the current detachment between providing um, grievance mechanism and providing effective remedy. So they do know that there is a, a clear distinction at the moment between there is a clear gap between the two and they are just uh, uh, too behind in developing an agenda around access to the remedy. They are just interested in ticking the box of providing a mechanism without really going to uh, understanding if they are also uh, providing a remedy. And this is problematic also in uh, terms of organizational learning, because we don't know whether businesses are actually learning anything from the abuses that are happening uh, directly in their farms or along their supply chains. So I 
just wanted to ask if anyone had uh, any comments or um, any questions about it. Both Juan and I will be in Geneva next week. So if you are at the um, forum, please get in touch. And we are very uh, much interested in uh, understanding and knowing of other projects, ongoing projects on remedy. So um, we want to know what is out there. But if anyone wants to um, ask any questions or make any comments now, please raise your hand. I, I can make a comment. Please, Dan. <laughs> you know, I was listening curiously, you know, not only for the content of what's being learned, but uh, what, what I would love to have a discussion about perhaps in Geneva is, you know, how can we um, build, I, I call it connective tissue between folks like yourself and the organizations and um, companies that are engaged in this kind of work. And thinking about it as some sort of opportunity to create some living labs where we can learn as we go and adapt and inform and impact through the the research. Because it, you know, that last comment that you made, our business is learning from what's happening. It, my guess is is probably not because my guess is they're probably not talking to each other or collecting the kind of data that they need in order to um, build this into the organizational learning. And it strikes me that that might be a role that business schools can play if we're able to sort of build that connective tissue. It's just something to think about because it's, you know, at GBSN, you know, our role is to improve access to quality relevant locally relevant management education but i'm i'm still old school i think education um is informed by research <laughs> and so the more we can make that real time the better uh the more we could potentially connect it with exec ed or other kinds of um continuing education the better so um just a comment no need for any reactions but love to talk with the team about that next week and uh in geneva perfect thank you don and i can confirm companies are desperate uh, for help um they are relying mm -hmm. on very expensive consultants at the moment so <laughs> more research from business schools might help also that cause anyone else yes yeah, if, I, if i may in this context i'm excited about the case study of the fair food program because i'm such a believer in documenting also what works to help develop models um, that others can copy. And I think for your project, Lara and Oana, the re a reference to the Fair Food Programme, you know, might help to make the case for the UK context. And your comment um, on, you know, are we teaching remedy in my business human rights class? It's like in yours, a hardcore side note. I mentioned the pillar, but I don't elaborate on it. But I do want to change that next semester. I have a guest speaker invited and I would love to have your papers as background reading to at least, you know, um, show there is something happening in the space. There are no rights without remedies. And I sidelined it until now because I want to work on the front end of of um, preventing violations. But Alicia, you now convinced me <laughs> that... Um, it's both remedies, not just, um, you know, yeah. what happens after the fact, um, but uh, the existence also helps to preempt. And then yeah. what I took down, no longer have access to, is the, you said, what cycle, result, trust, use, result, trust cycle, I think you said? Yes, yes. Um, that, um, I think, is super interesting which definitely corresponds with experience i made in in uh oh, almost 20 years ago field work i did with the fair labor association um and again i think there's a link to uh, um lara and Duana's project where apparently there is a drive towards consolidation of the various grievance channels 
And I'm not sure if that's a good thing because what we learned back then is the more channels, the better because different people are, are comfortable with different types of grievance channels. So some want to put in writing, some want to call a hotline, some want to talk to a person. So the more channels you have, the better to build trust with, you know, through various means. And so I'm, I, I don't think, you know, consolidation is um, the best strategy if you understand that a trusted channel is the one that you have to aim for. Um, and I think, again, that could be a lesson from the Fair Food Program that this cycle is something that really needs to be proven to the target group. Otherwise, for instance, channels won't be used. So these are just some thoughts. Can, can I <laughs> add things, quickly? I enjoyed quick. both projects really great, great, great learning from you. I know we're out of time, but I want to add two things. That done, but thank you. Um, first of all, uh, the preventative remedy, and I really, um, I love the, the Fair Food Program are the ones who said it, and I love it. And I think that like the narrative in business schools and in businesses need to change towards that because I think right now businesses don't want to do remedy because remedy is not sexy because you're admitting you've done something wrong but if we can pitch it as this oh no but you're also preventing it yeah. then it can kind of change the narrative That's... between only admitting fault and I think that is how we are going to get people on board um, so I really yeah. like it and then I agree completely <laughs> with the consolidate and I think you can kind of do it in between where I think rather than trying to consolidate, you should be finding ways to share information so that the mm -hmm. different can work together. You have different because people, like you said, trust right. different ways. But if you yeah. can find a way so that they can share data, but yes. remain uh, separate, I think that is kind of the way that you can work with Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alicia. So I'm, I'm very British and uh, conscious of time. So I would like to come to a, uh, an end. But if anyone has any final comment. George, if yeah. I may, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I just I just wrote that because I, I had to leave as well. But I just wrote a message saying I'm also working on the on this field. Uh, if you if you happen to be uh, in Geneva next week, uh, it would be a pleasure uh, to meet you. And, and yeah, and continue the conversation over there and Jordi we count on you on Thursday November 30th you've been with us before so I hope this gives us a bit of time on the sidelines to talk more about remedy because there's a lunch as well planned I hope you got that invitation Thursday. Ah. no no I won't be there but but Monday to Wednesday happy to meet anybody online then on Thursday I'll send you a link thank you <laughs> okay but more next week. Um, this was really yeah. interesting. Thank you all. Yeah. Uh, if Thank the you so if much. the meeting is oh no, I can't. No, it's I was also online that... at two two p.m. to three p.m. We do one hour for an online audience, and I'd love to have all of you there. Please. Yeah, I might I might be on the train to Paris. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean no. I thought it was the day I was I was talking about refugees and supply chains, but no, that's the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I was on a train earlier too, so yeah, yeah. No, I mean, hopefully, French Wi-Fi will work on the sure. SN, on the, on the TGV. Yeah, great. Thanks. Sure. I mean, the link would be great, though. Yeah, uh, Alicia, do you want to see? Yeah. Oh no, okay. I was, I was waving. <laughs> I was okay. waving. <laughs> a huge thanks to Juliana as well that helped us with yes. the organizing with this meeting. Thank you so much. I'll see you hopefully next week at some point. And thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thank you. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. -bye. All. <laughs> Ciao. Yeah, thanks thank for the great work all. that's all doing.